So here is a battery. Okay, let me just kind of draw a little cartoonish picture. We have a positive terminal of the battery, negative terminal of the battery. And just a wire, and I'm going to, we can just think of this as a simple, single wire, uniform thickness, connecting one end of the battery to the, to the other, okay? And let's call this location B and location A. And we know that, um, again, a battery just is maintaining a charge separation. So, in fact, let me even draw this kind of like we drew our picture last time we were looking at the example of finding the, the charge distribution on the, the wires. Let's say we have a positive plate, positively charged plate, and a negatively charged plate. Okay. Something like that. So, Let's say we want to pick uh, a path that goes round trip. Well, let's say it starts at, uh, well, actually, let me reverse these because I want to start at A. So let's do the same thing as we did here. Let's start here and call that B. So we'll start at A and go back to location A. And location A just happens to be just outside of the positive terminal, okay? If I pick a, a path that is that starts at A and ends up at A, no matter what path I pick, it should give me a, a round trip potential difference equal to zero. That means if I could choose a path that goes out of the circuit, okay, and back like that, right, or something that goes around here or back like that. And that's interesting, but it doesn't really tell me much about the electric field inside the wires of the circuit, which is what we're interested in if we want to analyze uh, analyze the current and analyze the the uh, potential difference along the lengths of the wires of the circuit. So instead, I'm going to pick a path that goes, starts at A, goes through the wire, goes to B, then goes through the battery, and then back to A again. Okay, so we're going along in that direction. Well, I should draw the electric field everywhere along that path. And let's see. So let's say at a location here, or that's, in fact, let's say at location A, just outside the positive terminal of the battery, what's the direction of the electric field inside the wire? Yeah, pointing that way, right? It's kind of, again, think of it like a dipole. It's got to be pointing away from positive end. And at this point, the electric field is pointing how? Pointing down, right? We know that if we're in a steady state, that the drift velocity is equal to the mobility times the electric field, and that the current is N times A times V. So the drift velocity is following along going uh, the path of the wire, and so, so the electric field is going to be opposite to that. Okay, V is actually pointing that way, right? And here we have the electric field pointing that way. Okay, here the electric field is going to be pointing up. Okay, here the electric field is pointing towards there. And then inside the battery, how's the electric field pointing? It's going to be pointing in the opposite direction, right? From the positive to the negative. Okay, and it's actually going to be a larger magnitude, and so by rights I should draw the electric field doesn't matter if it goes through the plate. We're just representing a larger field vector. Okay. So I know the directions of the field along, and let's call this E of the battery. Just distinguish these E of the battery and E of the wire. In the steady state, so we have a single thickness wire. What do I know about the electric field everywhere inside the wire? Okay, it's parallel to the wire. What about the magnitude? Should be the same everywhere inside the wire. Where, what tells us that? How do we know that? Okay, the thickness stays the same, and therefore, from what principle do we know that the electric field stays the same? I n is equal to I out, right? If I, I mean, just pick anywhere in this in this wire. 
any, at any point in the wire, the current has got to be the same. So I at N is equal to I out. Well, we know that N, A, V, or just think of it as or just 1 and 2 if you want to label them that way. N1, A1, V1 is equal to N2, A2, V2, or writing this in terms of electric field, N1, A1, U1, E1 is equal to N2, A2, U2, E2. And uh, it's the same material, so the N's and U's are the same on both sides of the equation. It's the same thickness, so the areas are the same side, or, or the same on both sides of the equation. So the electric field should be the same everywhere in the wire. And it's got to follow the wire because it's driving the current in the steady state. Okay. So that means if I want to apply this, what we're going to call, we call this the node rule. Sometimes this is called the loop rule because we're talking about, if I can spell, we're talking about going around in a loop, okay, picking some path that goes around in the loop. And so what do we have? We're going to start here, go around, and come back to our starting point. So I'm going to have sort of two pieces to this path, right? I'm going to say a delta V round trip is equal to zero. So I have the sum of, or the negative sum of, the electric field in the wire dot some delta L plus the electric field in the battery dot that delta L across. So this is across the wire. This is across the battery. Okay. And really, and let me just emphasize this. Again, the most general form of this relationship between The electric field, so this is round trip. Electric field and potential difference is that it's an integral, okay? And you can always do an integral, okay? It just so happens that we just said the electric field inside the wire is a constant. It shouldn't change. And if we're thinking about our path, if I'm choosing a path that follows the electric field, think about doing that dot product. The magnitude of the electric field inside the wire times the magnitude of the length of the wire times the cosine of the angle between the two vectors, right? That's what we mean by taking a dot product. Well, if my path is always following the electric field, what's the angle? Zero, right? And so it's just going to give me E times the DL or E times delta L. And if the electric field is uniform, that electric field comes out of the summation or comes out of the integral which you can just say it's the magnitude of the field times the magnitude of the length of the wire. Okay, and that's a negative out front. And then we have to add that to the same sort of thing, right? If we assume that this is kind of like a capacitor, the electric field should be uniform uh, inside, the, uh, inside the plates. And again, my path is... Well, in this case, my path is in the opposite direction of the electric field, right? So I'm going to get either the battery magnitude times delta L across that length of the battery times the cosine of what angle? So what is it? 180, right? Because my path is now, if I think about travel traveling along this direction. When I reach the battery, I'm going in the opposite direction of the electric field. So we have a cosine of 180. And that whole thing has got to be equal to 0. Okay, So we get a sign, a flip in the sign here. If I get rid of this cosine 180, it becomes a negative 1. Okay, And I can divide by the sign here. So if we worked it out, we'd find that the electric field, as we would expect the potential difference across the wire is equal to the potential difference across the battery, right? This is just giving us E of the wire
equals E of the wire times the length of the wire is equal to E of the battery times the length of the battery. Okay. Now, again, interesting, but unfortunately we can't go much further with this. I mean, we could measure the lengths of the wire. Okay, the wire might be some distance long. We can measure how, how long the battery is. We can't actually get anywhere unless we know something about what's going on inside the battery. We Typically, we don't measure directly the electric field of the battery or electric field inside the battery, but we know something about uh, essentially the work done by the battery on a charge. And so let's think about a charge moving through the battery. And let me draw the battery again. Uh, let's draw it over here. I have a zoomed in picture here. So here's our positive terminal of the battery. Here's our negative terminal. Well, first of all, let's let's go back to this circuit for a second. What's direct what's the direction of electron current? So an electron here is moving in what direction? Towards the negative terminal, electrons are negatively charged, so they would have to move away from the negative terminal, right? So the drift speed is that way, or the drift velocity is that way, and therefore the little i, the direction of little i is that way, okay? So electrons are traveling through the wire in the opposite direction of the path I drew. That's okay. The path is just some arbitrary closed loop I'm drawing to find the potential difference. The electrons are really moving that way, okay? So they move this way, and they come to the positive terminal, and they go from the positive to the negative. So here's an electron inside the battery, and it's moving that way. So that means there's got to be a force on it in that direction to drive it from the positive to the negative. Now we said that the electric field inside the battery is pointing that way. What's the direction of the electric force on the electron inside? It's got to be the other direction, isn't it? That's the direction of the electric force. So it's not the electric force that drives the charge through the battery. It's not the electric force that maintains this charge separation. It's got to be some other force. And this other force is sometimes called, well, in the book they label it FNC. Okay, NC meaning non-coulomb. Coulomb meaning Coulomb's law, electrostatic uh, forces. It's not due to electrostatics, it's due to something else. And depending on the nature of the system, that something else could be some chemical reaction, like in a chemical battery that's maintaining this charge separation. It could be a, uh, we'll see magnetic forces that try to uh, maintain this charge separation later in the semester. In a mechanical battery, kind of like that model we showed uh, last time, you could just have imagine sort of turning a crank, okay, that's driving a conveyor belt, making charges go in the opposite direction of the uh, electric force, okay? So that means this non-Coulomb force is doing some work because the charge moves from one end to the other. I'll call this distance S, okay? So if the charge moves a distance S, then the work it does is going to be equal to the non-coulomb force times that distance s. And then we define something called the work per unit charge, or FNC times s over q. That thing has a special name. We give it the name EMF. Okay. So what is an EMF? Let me rewrite it over here. EMF, it stand, it, so historically it stands for electromotive force. That's a bad name for it because it's not a force. It's a work term or energy per unit charge. And so we can think of it as the work per unit charge done by the battery.
Okay. Well, if this charge is moving at a constant speed, at minimum, this force has to be numerical or equal and opposite to the electric force. Okay. And so it has to, has to be numerically equal to the electric force times that distance per unit charge. But the electric force times that distance, or the electric, if Fe divided by Q is just the electric field times that distance, that's just the, the change in potential across the battery. Okay. So the EMF for an ideal battery meaning a battery we, where we can approximate any inefficiency or any thermal loss due to uh, uh, being equal to zero. So very little energy gets dissipated away, we're, we're assuming, that all the work done is being just due to, is uh, going into driving the charge and not being dissipated away as heat, for example. Then in an ideal battery, we can just say that the EMF is numerically equal to the magnitude of the potential difference across the battery. Okay, So that means you can look at a battery, see what its voltage rating is. It's 1.5 volt double A cell battery or a 9 volt battery. And you say, okay, that's the EMF. And that EMF is going to be mostly independent of what's connected to the circuit. Okay, If it's a non-ideal battery, there's you get into some issues. But in the case of an ideal battery, uh, it's just a constant. It's just the number. It's just how much work the charge is going to, or how much work the battery is going to do per unit charge. And it's independent of what's connected to the circuit. Okay. Once we know that, well, then we've got it, right? Because now I can solve for the electric field of the wire because this part is essentially the magnitude of that EMF. It's the magnitude of that potential difference across the, across the wire. And so I can solve for it. I can say the electric field of the wire is just going to be the EMF over the length of the wire. Okay, if this wire has a total length of capital L, then I'm just solving that round trip potential equation for the unknown, which is the electric field of the wire, and I can figure it out. Okay. Once I know that, I could figure out other things. I could figure out the current the electron current because I know that's N times A times U times E. Okay, and so if I know the electric field in the wire, I can then figure out how much current is being driven in the wire. Given given I know that the uh, given I know the area and the uh, other properties like electron mobility and electron density. Okay. 